Wilderness survival after action. Training with gear. Train with gear. Uh, this is a good thing. Uh, we've got a we've got a lot to talk about. We have probably more material than we have time, but we're going to go ahead to endeavor. We're going to endeavor to persevere here because that's what we do. Yeah, Jared and I this last weekend we traveled over to see some of our friends, and we we took a wilderness survival seminar. It wasn't a uh, it was it was just a one day thing. We didn't have to sleep out under the stars, you know, on a rock or anything like that. But it was valuable information. It was it gave us a lot to think about. Uh, and and it did what all good training should do. It reinforced what I already knew, <laughs> and it gave me new material or new things to think about. Uh, if you if you go to training, hopefully, uh, well, if it's your first training, if it's if it's the first thing you've ever done, then everything's going to be brand new to you. And then as you progress throughout your life, it's it's more and more difficult to get the the nuggets, the those little nuggets of knowledge. Uh, that you've never experienced, so you got to have to you got to mine for those. Uh, we got a Duracoat finished firearm uh, Would segment. You say that it's more difficult to get the nuggets, but the nuggets are bigger. Mm, not necessarily. Or is it, are they still? Yeah, they're not necessarily bigger. Uh, it, it's not like you know. Very rarely do you, do you have like this this epiphanous moment where it changes your life. Uh, usually, the life changing stuff happens early on, uh, but it might. You know, you don't know. You don't know. That's why you go. That's why you go, because you never know what you're going to get. You might experience something uh, that you never experienced before. So we're going to talk about all that and more after Zach plays the super funky music. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, proudly brought to you from the SDS Import Studio. If you want quality that's affordable, visit sdsimports.com. We don't just talk guns and gear. We also discuss current events and politics because guns are politics. Now sit back and listen louder to your co-host, CEO of Full 30, Jared Markle, and your beloved host, the pimp hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. Were you going to SLC Fitness? Was it SLC Fitness or SLC Strength? SLC Strength and Conditioning. Strength and Conditioning. Were you going there uh, in Sugar House? Yes. Oh, okay. I think it might be technically Cottonwood Heights. But you, when you, it was it was Sugar House that you were using. Were you using that place when you were in the other one? When you were in, in Murray? Oh, you know what? I don't think. Or Holiday? Yeah, yeah Holiday. Holiday. Holiday is when I went there quite often. Yeah, because by the time you were in Sugar House, you had, it was too we far. had the Black Rifle Gym. Yeah, and it wasn't, I mean, it was too far for... Because there's so many gyms around here, I can go to a different gym and mm. and uh, and I, my coach is on my phone. So start it like the Barbell Logic coaches that you can go to studentofthegun.com slash BLOC and get more information about. I carry them everywhere on my phone. That's true. So I can go to That's any true. gym and still have my coach with me. Uh, so I had a conversation this weekend, and uh, uh, I haven't I haven't checked this out uh, to see how true it is, but. I was talking with somebody about uh, Marine shotguns, not United States Marine Corps uh, 590A1s or, or Benelli's or whatever, but the stainless silver ones, right? And uh, he said, I was thinking of getting a Marine shotgun, and then I priced them, and he said it was... Fifteen hundred dollars or something crazy. He, 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 the, he said, "Have you seen the prices lately?" And I said, "No." And the price that he quoted me seemed really high for a uh, pump action shotgun. Uh, and I know that there are the the you know the the silver stainless uh, polished uh, marine shotguns, and the reason that they do that, you guys know why they do that, right? They do that because, well, they do that because uh, they expect that gun. That gun is expected to be in and around water and moisture and not just regular water, but salt water. You know, normal humidity is bad enough, but salt water is extra bad. 
uh, ask anybody who's ever spent any time on a ship or a boat or what have you, and they will tell you that preventative maintenance is an ongoing, non-stop thing. So, the reason that I bring this up during the Duracoat Finished Firearm segment is my question to you, ladies and gentlemen. But we didn't play the audio. The, oh, the we should thing. play the audio. Okay, play the audio. All right, yeah, so Duracoat Finished Firearms brought to you by Duracoat. And if you go to, uh, well, if you follow the link in the show notes, you just go right there. How's that sound? So we often talk about colors, right? We talk about colors. Uh, we like, you know, we want to camouflage the gun or we want to make it, you know, stand out. We want to make it funky like the fire extinguisher gun or the snake gun or whatever. And, and I think that we often... We get so wrapped up in talking about the cool colors that we forget the original purpose of Duracoat. The original purpose of Duracoat is to provide a super tough, rust-resistant, environmental-resistant finish. Whether it's black or blue or green or orange or red or whatever, the whole point of the Duracoat is to provide a durable coating mm. for your gun. Imagine that. It's crazy. Wow. Yes. If you put Duracoat on steel and you apply it correctly, then the steel won't rust. <gasps> I know. That's crazy, right? So think about it. Let's say... Let's say, for S's and G's, that you had a standard Mossberg shotgun, 590, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we know that the receivers on the 590 are constructed of what, Jared? Um, what are you talking about? What, what material? I was reading this. What material? Pol polymer. Uh, no, the receiver. <laughs> the receiver is aluminum. Aluminum. The receiver on a 590 is aluminum. So aluminum in and of itself is not going to rust, right? So in that case, all you have to do is put color on it, right? Now, the barrel is obviously steel. And uh, the, the, uh, the uh, components and so forth, there's a lot of steel on a 590 shotgun, primarily the barrel and, and uh, you know, the, 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 under, the parts, the various parts. So what you could do, and instead, you say, well, I've got a standard, let's just, we'll throw 590 out there. We've got a standard 590 shotgun, right? But I want it to, I'm going to be using it in and around a marine environment or a, let's say, Biloxi, a Mississippi environment or a Louisiana environment or a Florida environment where everything rusts. How can we make it not rust? Well, you strip it down, you prep it and you pick Duracoat, some form or fashion of Duracoat, and you put it on there, and it won't rust. And you don't, like I said, I'm not, I have not priced your, will you do that for me? 590 Marine Shotgun. 590 Marima Marine Shotgun. There we go. Now, I don't want a review of it. I want to know how much it costs. What's the MSR? The Manufacturer's... Okay, that's, no, that's it's not going to let you buy guns. So you have to go to Mossberg.com and find the the MSRP. There we go. MSRP. What is? Eight twelve. Eight hundred twelve dollars Okay. So I'm not really sure which gun that, that the friend this guy was talking to. Uh, and you say $812 for a pump-action shotgun. That's a lot. Eh, it is kind of pricey. It is kind of pricey. Now, go to the standard non-Marine version. The standard uh, Model 590, standard not Marine, blue steel, no lasers or anything like that, right? Not the retrograde. Or... There's so many different models. Yeah. Holy 
crap balls. Yeah, just go to that one right there. Right there you go. Right standard right. 590. So a, a standard 590 532. is MSRP $532. So about not quite a $300 difference. You can buy a lot of Duraco for 300 bucks. Correct. Yeah. You can get a lot of Duraco for 300 bucks. So uh, if you are of the opinion that you want a shotgun or any gun to use in a marine environment, you don't want it to rust, but you also don't want to spend the extra three two hundred and seventy or three hundred dollars for a stainless marine finish. Well, put a little bit of elbow grease, a little bit of time and effort into it, and uh, you can indeed, uh, you can indeed get yourself a uh, a rust proof gun, a non rusting gun. Uh, so if you want to learn all about that and i know you do go to studentofthegun.com slash duracoat and you can learn all about it how's that sound you're welcome so what are we talking about just, now? i was just pricing the slightly darker black can and you can get a can with the aerosol kit for about 67 dollars well, there. Um, so that's well, there you go. A lot less than three hundred. Yeah, it's a lot less than two hundred and seventy nine or whatever the difference is. There you go. That's fantastic. So check out our good friends at Duracoat Firearm Finishes and let them know that Student of the Gun sent you. Yes, indeed. SDS Imports, the makers of the T Sauce pistols. Well, they the importers of the T Sauce pistols and the Tucker of shotguns and they they were. Jared, go to the the PX nine series. There, all right. There's three a, duty pistol. There's a. Oops. I had a, uh, a kind of an epiphanous moment. If you are a firearms instructor, if you plan to call yourself a firearms instructor, if you work for a firearms school, firearms training school, it is always good to have a spare gun or a rental gun or an extra gun or 10 yeah or 10 or whatever so i was thinking about the px9 the px9 is a is a tremendous candidate for a rental gun or a spare gun or whatever you want to call it Mm -hmm. Uh, i had a situation uh this weekend i was teaching a class and one of the students' guns failed. Failed. And it failed at the very beginning of the class. And you say, well, it sucks to be him. Yeah, well, I mean, it does. But there we are. We've all taken the time. We've all blocked out the time. We're on the range. We have the ammo. We have the time to train. And here we are with an equipment issue. So I had a spare gun. I, because at being an instructor, I always make sure that I have a, a spare gun. So I was thinking, what would be a good candidate for rental guns or spare guns or loaner guns or whatever? And I believe, based on their price and the fact that they run really, really well, and they are very simple to operate, uh, you don't want a rental gun that has a. Uh, uh, a, a long learning curve, right? Yeah. Because you want to be able to focus on marksmanship and training, not on, I need to learn how to work all the levers and, and widgets and stuff on this gun. You say, well, that's why you should be doing that anyway. Simple is better. Simple is better. Uh, that's why Glock outsells every other handgun. That's why every other company in the world uh both hated on glock and at the same time had to come up with their own glock what are you talking about paul well i'm going to tell you what i'm talking about smith and wesson hated on glock and then they came out with the smigma the smegma this this <laughs> this they came out with the smith and wesson smegma i mean sigma um and it was a colossal failure, but from the ashes of that failure emerged the M&P. Why? 
why didn't they just stick with the the 5906 if the 5906 was a superior gun if the 5906 was superior to the glock 17 why isn't the 5906 the current standard for smith and wesson well because yeah exactly uh why did sig why didn't sig continue to push the standard p226 why did they have to come up with the what the heck is it p320 what's the the, 365 the carry no no not that not that one the uh the one they just sold to the army what do they call the one they sold to the army uh, I can't remember because I just don't care that much. <laughs> no, no. The so if the the two two six was the superior of oh, M seventeen, yeah, the M seventeen, which is based on the three twenty. If the if the two two six was superior to a Glock seventeen, why did Sig have to develop the three twenty? uh exactly thank you very much uh the point is the the point is that uh ladies and gentlemen simple is better and the px9 works well it it works like a glock it is a striker fired handgun and the safeties are all internal and you stuff a magazine in and you rack the slide and it's ready to go so if you guys are out there or you if you're endeavoring to be a firearms instructor or if you're working for a firearms training school or whatever and you're looking for a rental gun or a loaner gun or whatever, I would look really heavy. You don't need for a rental gun, you don't need the RMR slide cut, you don't need a threaded barrel, you just need the standard out of the box duty gun. And I think do they come with three ma- do they come with three mags? I can't remember. I think so. They either come with two no, they come with two. Let's Includes see. One each, twenty round and eighteen round standard capacity magazines with loader. So you okay. get two magazines. Uh and uh Okay. And the the holsters for them are they're they're, they're easy to find. Uh, you know, so Jared, you're telling me this is a twenty plus one capacity on a yeah on a uh, pistol. Yep, it's twenty plus one. Wow. So that's a lot of shooting. You know what's funny is uh, we had somebody uh, on the line yesterday that was shooting a, a Glock forty three, which is a, is a, a a fine gun. Nothing wrong with the forty three, but the mags are what six or seven rounds. I think it's six plus one. Uh, seven plus one. I th- yeah, I think ah, the forty three is six head. plus one. Yeah, six. Yeah, six plus. Yeah. One. So, the one shooter had a Glock forty three and was shooting very, very well with it, and everybody else either had a a G nineteen or a G seventeen. That one person got a lot of reloading. Yes, guys. yes, and uh, uh, which is good. I mean, you, if you want practice reloading, and, uh, and that person had three magazines. I was impressed because I think the guns only come with one or two. Uh, they had three magazines for it, but still, uh, the the amount of mag loading versus the guys with the seventeens and the nineteens. <laughs> Yeah, you get a lot of practice stuff in mags when you when you show up with one of those. So, and we're going to talk about that uh, more later on. So, TSOS, uh, the TSOS PX9-3, uh, uh, if you are looking for a rental gun or an inexpensive gun or just a, just a good all-around gun, uh, give, it a, give it a look. Give it a look. All right. What's next, Jared? What is next on the hot list, a hot sheet? Next on the hot sheet, we've got High Point Firearms. Let's see, hi-pointfirearms.com. You need my fingerprint, which you don't have. Yeah. I think it's going to keep turning off because it's at 24% battery life. Oh, uh, yeah. I need to change this thing so it doesn't do that. Ah, uh, there we go. Hi-point. Hi-point. There you go. Uh, Hi-pointfirearms.com. Uh, and what's new? Oh, more SHOT Show news and yep, stuff. Getting ready to go to SHOT Show and the Great Amer- American Outdoor Show, G-A-O-S. Uh, are we going to SHOT? Yes. 
I think. Yeah, remember we? Yeah, Do we, we have our booth? We don't have a booth, you idiot. <laughs> well, I mean, thankfully we don't have to do that. Well, actually, here's the thing. I bet the booth uh, prices are lower than they've ever been after the last couple mm, of years. I don't know. They're they're pretty. Uh, I'm not saying they're cheap. Uh, I'm saying I'm just saying they're probably lower yeah. than they've been. They're standard. Yeah, they're same, standard. Same price. I'm sure. They're yeah. I I have insider information on that. <laughs> There you go. Standard with without negotiation. Well, you know, that actually brings me to a good point. What you could do if you were a firearms training school is you could get uh, the High Point C, uh, C9 yeah. as a rental gun. And if people are a loner gun and people show up, when people show up with their Gucci Glocks and their or, or their super high-end uh custom 1911s and they all break when 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 they break say well i do now that your gun is no longer functioning we do have a loaner and go into the box and say here's your loaner bro <laughs> i think that actually is a fantastic idea and i'm glad that i just had it <laughs> that'd be pretty funny wouldn't it and uh, James, my good friend, my dearly departed friend, James Jaeger, he said there is a direct correlation between the amount of money you spend on aftermarket accessories and the reliability of the gun. The more the more aftermarket garbage you put on a gun, it, it's he said it's it's a it's a like I don't know a not a, a bell curve or a. a the, the the more you spend, the more unreliable it becomes. No, that's not true at all. Yes, it absolutely is based on eighty to ninety thousand students who show up with their own guns that they have purchased. There is a direct correlation between the amount of money that people spend on aftermarket garbage to put in their guns and the reliability or lack of reliability. He, uh, James says that he trained over 80,000 students who showed up with guns that they bought with their own money. And Farnham said the same thing. Mm -hmm. Farnham, way back when in the early 90s, John Farnham's like, he goes, he goes, everyone who shows up with a custom 1911 has it fail it it fails uh, before the end of the first day. They get a lot of practice in yeah. fixing stoppages and whatnot. He said some of the failures are just stoppages. Some of them are catastrophic, meaning the gun will no longer work. That is not what you want. That is not what you want. That is not what you want. So if you, uh, and the thing is, what is the MSRP on a C9? I, I think it's less than 200 bucks. I think it's like. It might be two twenty five or two twenty nine or something like that. Here we are. There you go. Clicky the button. You know, lots of nice pictures, awesome. but I don't want pictures. I want info. I want information. Information. There we are. One ninety nine. One ninety nine. MSRP. One ninety nine. So you can get the HC model that is two thirteen. What's HC? Hard case. Oh, it comes with a hard case. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. If if you wanted to be a, a a kind and benevolent and generous firearms instructor, what you do is you just go and get yourself a, a model a high point model C nine and three magazines and a a holster for it. That's the trick. You got You need a, a a stiff holster for it. Stiff. A, a firm, rigid holster. That's how she likes it. And uh, when when your guys show up with these super cool custom nineteen elevens, and then forty five minutes into the training day, it it fails. Say it's cool. I've got a loner. <laughs> Remember the uh, movie The Mask? Yeah. He's like, bring her, Carl. Bring around. The loner. And Jim Carrey looks at him and he goes, The loner? No, right. no, no. We should not compare the fine products from highpoint-firearms.com. 
high dash point firearms dot com to high dash that. point. We should not make that to the loader because yeah. high dash point firearms dot com provides only fantastic products. Well, you know what's funny? What's that? Is if you were to do that, dude? I want to. I want to teach a class now so badly just to do that. <laughs> uh, what will happen is they'll what they will end up doing is is running the whole class with the high point and realizing that and works. realizing that it works yeah. better than their sixteen hundred dollar custom yeah nineteen eleven uh or or what would be. <laughs> Or what are what are they gonna do? Like cry and sit over in the corner? Say, I don't want to do that one. <laughs> well, that would be a great way to weed out the people that don't really actually want to be there. Oh, that 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 paid you to show you their, their they paid you cool so stuff. they could show you their cool stuff. Which those people do exist in the world, believe it or not. Oh yeah, they come to classes. Uh, our listening audience right now is like, I would never do that. What? There's yeah. What are you like talking that? about? I would yeah, never go to a class. There actually, is with the mindset that I was there to show the instructor how cool I was and what cool toys I have. Yeah. All right. Uh, Juxi, if you were to go to Juxi.com right now, J U X X I.com, you could have, you could be watching the, how to rack your weights video. Yeah. You could be doing that. If you want to get directly to the student of the gun channel on Juxi, you go to student of the gun.com slash Juxi. That kind of makes sense. Yeah. There you go. And the how to rack your weights video, it teaches you one way to do multiple things. That's right. So, it's that's MED. Like to, as instructors, we like to teach students one single way that they can accomplish multiple tasks. Yeah, that's we, we embrace the minimum effective dose method. That's what we embrace. All right, Zach, tell the new listeners what they should be doing. Attention, new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. Hey, all right, we're back. <laughs> uh, we're back from commercial. Uh, <laughs> Where we don't get muted, by the way. Yes, uh, we're back from commercial. We, we were muted until the commercial was over. Yeah. yeah. And and now we're going to go to the uh, student of the gun homeroom, brought to you by our good friends at CrossbreedHolsters.com. Wait, what? Wait, do what? Do you mean no. Brownell's bullet points? Oh, how, how did we get all the way down there? How did my notes? Oh, oops. Sorry, I was all quartied up there. <laughs> uh, I got I got all Yes, yes. I'm sorry. I, I was quirty, uh, but now I'm not. So... The Brownells bullet points, obviously, if you go to brownells.com, you can buy stuff. You can buy pieces and parts and components and so forth. And you're like, you seem to be kind of a jerk about installing aftermarket accessories on handguns, Paul. Or, well, no, I'm, I'm not really a jerk about that. Uh, I feel the same way about rifles and shotguns, too. <laughs> there are accessories that will... Oh... Uh, help and aid you uh in in, in your endeavors but un unfortunately we we live <laughs> we live in a world where there are manufacturers that are not helping have you ever have you ever seen that or have you ever experienced that jared where someone is there they're, they they get involved and you're like you know you're not helping that's not helpful. Yes, quite often. It, it, I mean, that's it's it, the name of the game with advertising and, and marketing and whatnot. Is so like you're you're, uh, uh, you're you're not helping here. And when, like for instance, uh, people who the companies that make uh, California compliant 
guns and accessories and add-ons and so forth so that that people who are living in these whether it's california or new york connecticut or whatever whichever slave state you want to talk about you're not helping you might think you are now i don't think those people even think they're helping but you're not helping now if you want to know what is valuable uh, if you want to know which accessories are valuable or or which ones you actually need see this is that's the question is how many people buy an aftermarket fill in the blank um just stuff stuff after manual anything. controls <laughs> you know I, I'm, I'm trying to like not say yeah that's naughty right. words just, yeah. uh aftermarket extended magazine releases and extended slide slot stocks and and ambidextrous this and blah, 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 blah. how many people buy that stuff and bolt it under their guns before they've even taken five minutes of professional training most most do you want to know what you really 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 need or do you want to know how your gear is actually going to function Oh, you know what? We did an article called A-R-M-E-D, The Armed Project. We did that. This is specifically for a rifle. Yeah, for rifles, for black rifles. But we did this, and it's the minimum effective dose for an AR. Yeah. It's armed. Yeah, that was our thought process. We're like, can we do a minimum effective dose for an AR? This weekend... I taught a handgun class, the uh, the martial application of the pistol class, and what I uh, what I was able to do for my students was I was able to present them with a situation to put them in a situation where they would have to discover for themselves whether the gear that they brought with them was good, was useful, and effective, or was not. And also, when you go to training, if you don't read the gear list, (laughs) if you don't read the gear list and you show up minus something, for instance, if you show up on the range and you don't have, you say, well, I I got a good holster and uh, uh, what, what people think is a good holster and you don't really know. And that's the point of this whole thing that he's talking about right now is you don't really know what quality gear is for yourself until you take your gear you to use training it. Yeah. and actually figure out if it works for you because what works for you might not work for me but however there are there are indeed universal things that are not good yes right? there's, there's there's things, things that, that don't work for you don't work for me and are never going to work they don't work for anybody yeah like no no that works yeah. no, 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 and on the other end there's also universal things that will work for most everybody it, it is yeah. one size fits almost everybody instead of one size fits nobody so yeah there's, so there's those two extremes but then there's most everything else in the middle that is it'll work for you but might not work for me the only way to fight figure that out is what dad's talking about yeah if you for instance if you show up uh for a class without magazine pouches you can get by by just shoving your spare mags in your back pocket or front pocket or, or cargo pocket or whatever I, uh, and it seems like it's a good idea until you're on the ground yeah. and then you got to fish into your front pocket to get a magazine. You're like, oh, that's yep. it's not I, very convenient at all. I've personally trained both ways where I have, I guess, what they call a, a battle belt nowadays. Yeah. It's cool. It's a cool term um, where I have a battle belt that has all the pouches and everything that I need. And I've also trained with just the clothes that I wear in a normal everyday yeah. scenario. And um I, I prefer to have a place for everything rather than using pockets. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a reason for that. You know, yeah. James once said, he's like, look, if you're going to come to fighting rifle or whatever, and you don't want to spend a lot of money on gear, he said, that's fine. Show up. With he goes, show up with a rifle and a sling and some magazines. And if you, if you want just, you know, you can shove spare magazines in your back pockets uh, and, and you'll get by. Now you'll discover that there's a better way to do it. Yeah. Uh, and it'll make your, see, the thing is, if you have good gear, it makes your training experience better. That's the problem that people experience showing up with, with inferior gear or bad gear is 
they end up spending all their time focusing on the gear yep. and and why and trying to make it work instead of on the learning process. But that is learning, I guess. It's a different kind of learning. There's if you're the uh, type of person that is a um maybe stubborn's not the right word, but it's it's partially in there, right? But hard headed. Yeah, hard headed. That's what I'm looking for. Hard headed. Hard headed person that has to learn lessons for yourself. You can't learn lessons from other people's right. failures. No, nope. you're wrong. And then show up with what you got, and then after the training course, you'll know. Oh, yeah. If you're a person that likes to learn from other people's mistakes and, and take in that information and then show up to the training class, then get the stuff that the instructor says to have. <laughs> right? There's a there's a minimum effective dose of nothing. Yeah. And then there's a minimum effective dose of things that are going to help you actually consume the information and retain it. And, uh, if you're one yeah. of those people who's like, I'm not putting Loctite on stuff because I might want to change it someday, you're probably going to have to change it on the range because it's going to be gone. <laughs> well, uh, we've had muzzle devices on the ground. We've had sights on the ground. Oh, yeah. Optics on the ground. Optics fall off. Of muzzle devices fall Flashlights off. Flashlights. Sights fall off. I was in a training class one time where if the dude's flashlight fell off. It was a good flashlight. It was actually a quality flashlight. I'm yep. not going to mention the brand. But it fell off, probably because it wasn't locked tight. But then it got Loctite. stepped on and it broke. Oh! And I was like, I was very, I was surprised because the brand is is a quality brand and Ugh. has a a really good um, reputation. And I was like, man, I I don't know, like, how did that get, did it get stepped on by everybody? It, <laughs> everyone what stepped on here? it. Like, you got stepped on ten times. Like, I guess it's a good thing that that happened because that light that specific one from that company might have needed to be replaced. Yeah, there you go. There you go. But, um, and things don't always work out the way you think they will. You see, that's another thing we do as gun, as gun owners and, and uh, people who are in the community is we buy stuff imagining that it will work a certain way. But then you go out to a training class and you have to perform and when you're trying to perform the thing that you bought doesn't it may or may not work as well as you thought it did or maybe you might be surprised you might be you know, super surprised and you're like wow that actually worked out better than i thought it was going to work out uh so my brownells bullet points uh point of the day is before you buy uh before you buy ambidextrous whatevers and extended whatevers and and well before you buy dubers that's for you jay before you buy dubers to bolt onto your gun you might want to just take the gun that's in the box um and go now i'll give you i'll give you a great example of of a, a learning process one of the learning processes uh, was the sights on handguns. God bless Glock for making their products. But the plastic generic standard sights on Glocks are garbage. And they'll admit it. I mean, if, if we were in the same room, they're like, yeah. There. Well, you, ha you have to think from a, a production standpoint from a company. Yes. Right? You, you want them to focus on the sights or do you want them to focus on the gun functioning because sights you can change out easily. so people say well if the standard plastic front sight rear sight on a glock is garbage why is it there it's there to keep the price point down and you're welcome it's there to, to reduce the price point and they'll and they'll sell you they'll sell you nuclear sights they'll sell you three dot nuclear sights um if you want them which you don't because you don't need three dot nuclear sites um but uh for instance we do a drill where you have an injured paw where your left you know your 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 support hand is not working and you cannot use your support hand to do anything so you have to do everything one-handed you're like cool just a handgun hold it with one hand and shoot it what happens when it it goes click it goes boom boom click or that's it goes, not the song. It goes. It's click, click, boom. Click, click, boom. What if it? Yeah, it t that's not how that works. Maybe no. That that's the the uh, the the uh, what do they call it? The 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 striker. No. What what, what are they? What was Taurus saying? Double strike capability. Oh. 
Like, our guns have double dual strike capability for when your chamber is empty and you just want to keep hammering on it with a trigger and nothing. <laughs> oh, that makes me cringe. But anyway, uh, if you're trying to rack the rear sight off your belt and you have those plastic Glock sights, what our, our folks found was not really, uh, not really conducive not really conducive uh so you learn a lot from training you're like that's crazy i've never heard that i hear the first one to tell me that okay yeah all right qwerty and, and that goes to anything hold on i have a thing to say and this is in regards to training um a shakeup is coming and it's coming for student of the gun university we're going to be changing the way that the students of the martial lifestyle learn uh, that's you you're listening to us you're probably a student of the martial lifestyle and if you want to have more information on that go to sotgu.com uh, for just to give you a little bit more here what we're doing is we're really leaning into the minimum effective dose method of training right so when you show up to a training class there are portions of information that i know what you're doing so you sign up for the class and then you go on the internet and you're like oh, i need to learn more about this thing before i show up at this class so i don't look completely dumb right that's what we all do. So what we're doing is we're taking what you're already doing and we're packaging it into a structured class that we're going to teach you so that you know things that you need to know before you even show up to the training range with us. And that way it gives you the opportunity to get more out of the actual live training class because now you've it'll be the second time or third time or however many times you take the online course before you show up to the, the uh, residency training. It'll be one extra rep that you get before you even show up in, in person. So when you're in person, you've already consumed that information and it gives you an opportunity to pick nuggets out that you may not have had the opportunity to get if the information was being distributed to you for the first time. Yes. And rather than go to someone else's YouTube channel and have them tell you what you should be doing, we're just going to go ahead and give you that information. Yeah, we're going to help you out. We're going to give you that information. So you're welcome. Or you will be welcome very soon. All right, so let's get QWERTY up in here. ShopSOTG.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun. Whether you want to expand your brain, increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the pimp hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out shopsotg.com today and see for yourself. Yes, indeed you do. And we have an update to SOTG, shopsotg.com. Uh, we've been working on this for a little while now. It's been in the background. We have a brand new uh, lot, uh, kit in the Lifesaver line of first aid medical trauma thingy kits. So if they go to pocketlifesaver.com, I'll get them directly to the page they need to find this kit. That is exactly where you will find this at the time of the episode's release. So if you're listening okay, live, perfect. It's not there yet. That and that is the uh, L M I T kit, also known as the Limit Kit. That's L M I T is an acronym, right? That stands yes. for yep. uh, Laceration and Minor Injury Treatment Kit. Woo! That all came from Zach's brain, by the way. I am so smart; it hurts. Yeah, Limit. That's, it's great, yeah. yeah. I just He presented that, and I was like, that is a fantastic idea. Let's do that. I am full of those. But he yeah. said, Gump, you're a daggum genius. Yep. You're a daggum genius. genius. You're, you're a daggum so genius. So give them a quick idea of what's in these kits, and they're very low price point. We wanted them so that everybody can get it, and everybody should have multiple of them because they're – it's it's just it's a, a limit kit. You're gonna it's for lacerations and minor injuries, which we get quite often, especially if you have kids. I'm yep. learning that. Yep. yep. So exactly. So one thing I learned uh, th through the years and years that we've had the Pocket Life Server Kit is nine out of ten times that people pop them up and use them, and we hear about it, it's because somebody got cut, somebody got scraped up, somebody got a big boo boo that was bleeding, but it wasn't right. something that somebody needed a tourniquet for. So. Right. And we also want to have something that is really small that you can throw in a backpack, throw in your back pocket, something cheap you can give to your kid, like the student kit, which have been discontinued. Uh, so that is what this is for. It is a pretty much just a boo-boo bleeding cut 
la like laceration and minor injuries. Scrapes, cuts, stuff like that. It's a roll of gauze, a roll of vet wrap, and a pair of gloves. All sealed up. Well, it's Coban. Coban, yeah. the thing. Coban. Yeah, if you're Coban. a veteran. Curlax, of, Coban, and gloves. If you're a veteran of the either the truncated four-hour Beyond the Boo Boo course or the full 16-hour course, you'll know that we often recommend these in class. It's like, hey, get this, get this, put it in a bag, and and then you'll be good to go. And uh, there's been a couple people that in classes, or a few of them, that are like, hey, same thing with the pocket lifesaver. Can't you just do that for us? And put all that, that stuff me? in a bag and get and sell it to me. Yes, the answer is yes, and here it is for you. So you're welcome. You there are you go. very welcome. Yeah, and again, it's it's small, it's cheap. You can give it to your teenager. You can throw it in your back pocket. There's no excuse to not have it on you at any point. There's no there's no metal in it whatsoever. Yeah. So Woo. if you're going somewhere where they beep you, you know. Yeah, there's no reason not to have a kid on you all the time. And we all have medical conditions that if we lose too much blood, we'll die. So That's right. You can carry that thing anywhere. Absolutely. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the uh, Crossbreed Holster Student of the Gun Homeroom. Brought to you by Crossbreed, Crossbreed Holsters. Holsters. All right, all right, all right. Uh, somebody who looks a lot like me wrote an article called The Failed Strategy of Defense. And this was picked up by Ammoland. It was picked up by TTAG. It was picked up by a, a company called studentofthegun.com. And essentially, I talked about the... People who give advice never throw the pu first punch. Uh, military advice, never fire until fired upon, which I've always thought is the most F-tarded thing I'd ever... It's like, Why so you, you want me to wait until I'm shot? Well, what if the first bullet kills me? Never fire until fired upon. But what if, what if the first volley of fire kills me? Or never throw the first punch. So what you want me to do is to be, you want me to wait to get punched first. Yeah, don't you know how to dodge, dive, dip, and dip, dodge? dive, dodge, and duck? So, and I said in the article, I think it, I think I pointed out Chuck Liddell. I said, so you, if I get into an altercation with Chuck Liddell, your advice is to let him hit me first before I respond. And I said, well, what if that first punch knocks you unconscious or down to the ground or well, whatever? To be fair, if you're getting in an altercation with Chuck Liddell, you probably deserve to be punched. Well, I don't know. Maybe he <laughs> was yet. being bad. Maybe he was being mean. He's well, being mean to me. So a story just came up that proves that how whenever I, I think I wrote this article originally in like 2012 or 13 or something. You remember the title of it? It's called Never Throw the First Punch. The Failed Strategy of Defense. I'm going to find yep. it so that we can link it in the show notes for you. Uh, it is in there. Hey, there See? It is? Yeah. Go down. Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to find it. There you go. So, Jared, go ahead and give us the details. This just happened. All right. Get this out of my face. Former Australian surfer Chris Davidson dies after being punched outside of pub. This is Monday, September 26, 2022 is when this article was published. Uh, former Australian surfer Chris Davidson has died aged 45 after being punched outside a pub in Australia. Uh, police said that they were called to a pub on Saturday evening in Southwest Rocks, New South Wales, after reports a man had allegedly been punched in the face outside the premises. According to the police, the man had fallen to the ground and hit his head on the pavement. Not a good thing. Yep. When officers arrived, they found a 45-year-old man unconscious. He was treated at the scene by paramedics before being taken to the hospital, where he died a short time later. Specialist officers were sent to the crime scene. Shortly afterwards, a 42-year-old man was arrested in connection with the death. He was charged with assault causing death and refused bail to appear before the port. Well, that's racist. They wouldn't give him bail? Yeah. Don't they know that's racist in Australia? Uh, 
Surfing Australia That's said a, in a statement. A magazine yeah, or something. Magazine or something. <laughs> or said in a, a statement website. that it, it and the surfing community were mourning the loss of Davidson. Surfing Australia and the surfing community are mourning the loss of former WSL championship tour surfer Chris Davidson, who passed away at Kempsey Hospital on Saturday evening. That was a quote from their Facebook. Yeah. It leaves behind a wife and two children. So long story short is... Don't go to bars. Well, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't go to places you shouldn't go. Yeah. I, I love that. And, and nothing bad will ever happen to you. No, the point is, here we have a situation where this dude was punched one time, knocked down, cracked his skull on the concrete, asphalt, whatever, parking barrier, and is dead. And yet, there are still people out there in the world that will say, never throw the first punch. Uh, only fire, fire to pawn. Uh, the best, you know, defense this, defense that, defense whatever. And one of the, the uh, things that I offered in the article was that the people who often give this advice, the people who tell you, don't ever throw the first punch, you know. Don't you know? Only fire, fired upon. Blah 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 blah. Those people are actually never in a position where they have to take their own advice. They're telling you to go out there and absorb the blows or whatever, but they they don't think they'll have to do it. They're not. It's not advice for them. That's advice for you. I have two pieces of two pieces of advice. Go ahead. One is uh, go take some training so you can get punched in the face so you know what it's like just in case it ever happens. Um, number two is don't wait on somebody else to throw the first punch. No. You're like, well, how will I know? And how can I justify it? You know, we've spent, I don't know, decades talking about uh, pre-assaultive cues. Uh, didn't we, did we talk about pre-assaultive cues in the, uh, uh, the empty hand self-defense video? pretty sure we did i know we talk about that in our live training videos how do you know that someone is about to attack you before they attack you how could you say how could you stand in front of a jury and, and they say well, well how do you know that that guy was going to attack you and you say well based upon i would like to present this behavior <laughs> based upon this behavior this is what people do right before they attack you uh, and we know this. I mean, when I was in the police academy, we we learned about pre-assaultive behaviors. How do you know someone is just about to hit you, attack you, uh, try and take your gun away from you, whatever? We learn these things. And often the reason people get assaulted or they get assaulted and they're surprised that they got assaulted is because either they don't know or they ignore pre-assaultive behavior they, they either don't realize that they've never been taught it or or they just ignore it uh, or they're like ah oh, well you know blah blah uh but ladies and gentlemen we're all about being dangerous on demand here right and we need to understand that one punch can kill you right <laughs> there you go breakfast club me hitting you you hitting the floor yep two hits me hitting you, you hitting the floor. Uh, and we joke about that, but there's a, a man is dead. And he's not the first person to die uh, from that. Or even if you don't die, look at what happened to Michael Hutchinson. Michael Hutchinson, the Australian singer from In Excess, was uh, attacked by a, ta a taxi driver. Got out and, and uh, this dude sucker punched him. He went down, cracked his skull. And he didn't die from it, but he received uh, severe, what we call, uh, death or serious bodily harm. Mm -hmm. Serious bodily harm from that attack. He was never right again. Some people say that contributed to his eventual death. Uh, was because, And he was never right again. And it was from one single sucker punch. Did he have Dane Bramage? He had Dane Bramage. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, this is this is important. It's important. You need to understand that. And that's we want to be dangerous on demand. So uh, 
I thought, well, this is a this is a good example. This is a learning example, and and uh, you know, don't be that guy. And if you want to be carrying your gun like you should be carrying your gun, uh, go to crossbreedholsters.com. One of the things that uh, I want to make sure you guys understand is that Crossbreed has accessories for men and women. If you're a woman and you're trying to figure out how to carry a gun on your body, they can help you out. And use the promo code SOTG when you shop. All right, you want to go ahead and get into the uh, after action? Yeah. All right, I'll let cool. you go first. You got Hold notes? My little notes. You got notes on your phone? Yeah. Uh, so we went to this wilderness survival course. It was, yep, a, we sure it was did. a short seminar. And uh, let me turn on this focus mode because there's too many Fargan notifications. Good Lord. All righty. So the, the seminar was based upon... 72 hours, right? Surviving 72 hours in the wilderness with just the clothes on your back. So not even a backpack. And we went over sh building shelter. It's the, the core four. It's shelter, water, fire, food, right? And I don't know if we've talked about this before, but those are the things that you need in the order that you need them. Shelter, water, fire, food. And so we went over how to build that, how to build some shelter uh, if you have nothing on you. So you have to find some sticks and and whatnot essentially make uh, the spine of an animal and uh and then it's big enough for you right you find a stick that's a little bit taller than you so that you can lean it on something yeah when he says the spine of an animal he doesn't mean go find like a, a dead deer spine no no you're using you're, sticks you're to creating build a spine yes and then you use your the elements around you to make a little structure that you can sleep inside of and keep warm it's like you're, you're, you're making uh, a stick and grass sleeping bag, essentially. Yes. And the, the purpose of that is to regulate your temperature. So yeah. Thermoregulation at, at night. Most people who, who get lost uh, and then are eventually, they find their bodies later, died of exposure. They died because they couldn't keep their bodies warm enough. Yeah. And there were some tips in there where you can dig a moat around the the structure so that you can uh, channel water if you need to, if you're away in a from it, heavy water area, yeah. which I would probably just do anyway, just in case. Cause if you don't know where you're at in the wilderness and you don't know where the water's obviously, if, if you're down the hill <laughs> at the bottom of a mountain, then the water's going to come there anyway, it's gonna and, come down. And you know, but uh, I would probably just take the time to build the moat anyway, because there's no negative consequence of that except for maybe calorie deprivation. Uh, what was another thing? Oh, signaling. So something I didn't think about on top of the structure that you build for you to sleep in was if you have something like the jacket that I had on had orange in the inside, so you could flip it inside out, lay it on top so that people can find you uh, if that's what you want. And obviously if you're trying to survive 72 hours in the wilderness with nothing on your, with nothing that you, uh, nothing else other than your clothes, you probably want to be found. Yeah. And, and the reason that we're the stuff that we were taught in this class is taught the way that it was because you have 72 hours and within that 72 hours, most places in the world, especially the United States, you'll have some sort of medical attention. Somebody will rescue you. If, yeah. if you do, if you do the right things, if you can stay alive for three days, chances are really good that you'll be found. Yep. Unless you're that, that idiot that had to cut his own hand off because he, he didn't tell anybody where he was going, and so nobody actually knew he was missing, and nobody knew to look for him. Oh, that would suck. Yeah. What was that movie, 128 Hours or something like that? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, they made it. Uh, yeah, Franco. James, James Franco, who was apparently... Yeah, he, he, he portrayed right the guy who got stuck in a rock crevice, and he had to cut his own hand off because he had gone out into the wild, wilderness to do rock climbing, yeah. didn't tell anyone where he was going to be. No one knew to look for him. So nobody was trying to find him. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that movie. Yeah. That sucks, though. Yeah. And then, so after the shelter, we moved on to water. Um, w most of the stuff in the water I already pretty much knew because we, like when we went to um, the 4 shooting sports camp, we mm -hmm. talked a lot about this stuff. And yeah. I didn't take living history as an entire, like an entire uh, camp session. Yeah. Like I didn't take that as a discipline. But I because you were one of the instructors in that I probably just got exposed to the uh, topics and whatnot that you guys teach. Um, boiling the water 
will kill water, most waterborne pathogens. So that's the one of the best ways to uh, get make it so you, you can drink the water. So you could scoop mud out water out of a mud pit or a cream uh, stream or whatever, and you can boil that water. And we went over ways to take a piece of a log, a piece of wood, make a bowl out of it. So you're you're doing what the uh, the Indians used to do to make canoes, right? You you'd burn you burn it hot out. rocks yeah. and you'd burn it and you chisel it and and whatnot. You put put coals. You get the coals out of the fire, put them on the thing. It's actually pretty interesting. I'd, I'd like to do that sometime. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, "Well, if I don't have a knife on me, okay, cool." Oh, uh, and the Shame truth is, you. even if you had a pocket knife. Yeah. You probably you it would take you a long, 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 long time if you had a pocket knife to carve a bowl out of a log. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, the the fact of the matter is is all of these things. There's there's several reasons you do all of this stuff. Number one, if you are lost, it, it, there's few things in the world more terrifying to a human than realizing or coming to the realization that they don't know where they are and they don't know how to get out. Yep. They don't know how to get back to people or back to where they need to be. That's psychologically terrifying. And so in order to deal with that psychological terror and that shock and the trauma, the psychological trauma, what you do is you keep you do stuff. You keep yourself busy. If you just sit out on the ground and start thinking about how how sucky it is and and this is terrible, you're you're gonna you're gonna fall apart. So the the constructing the shelter, finding the water, the fire. See the one thing that that I I'm not gonna argue with her about, but one of the things that I was actually taught previously was that the sooner you could build a fire, the better. Because a fire is good psychologically. Mm-hmm. Uh, fire is also good from just keeping warm, you know, from a physical standpoint to keep you warm. Yeah, now, once you have fire, you can boil water if you need to. Also, uh, is if you can get a fire going immediately. And Jared, how many how many times have we talked about when we when we came up? What do we call that kit, Zach? The little survival kit that we. Uh, I think it was just literally called the wilderness survival kit. The wilderness survival kit. Um, threes when when she was doing your class did she talk about threes yeah the rule of threes rules of threes that, that was the why. international thing is three yep. three horns you know one two yep. three horns uh three fires you know three big you know stacks if you stack rocks in 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 like a triangle out in a in an open field people fly over and they're like hey someone did that on purpose that, that's not just an accident if you start what and we and we've said once you get the first fire going, then go start a second one, yep. then go start a third one. Yep. Because someone flying over is going to see a triangle of fires, and they're going to know that's not just an accident. That isn't just a you know a, a hunter out camping. That's that is a signal. Uh, and the sooner you can do that, the better. Uh, her thing is the the sooner you get the shelter built, the better. Which I which I believe. Yeah. You know, you could you could argue those back and forth, but and the re- one of the reasons that she put it in this order, or or the survival community does it in this order, is because of the rule of threes, right? So you have you have three days without water before you die. You have three hours in extreme in extreme temperatures, extreme temperatures, whether hot or cold, to to live. So mm-hmm. you need the shelter. Um, three days for water. Fire doesn't really have a timeline, but you use it to cook your food potentially so and but you can go without food for three weeks or 30 days yeah and there's some three weeks or 30 days there's two schools of thought there Um, i would probably if i was out in the wilderness and i had to survive on just the stuff that i had i would assume that i only had three weeks because it's a shorter time than 30 days and um and essentially what she was saying is the goal if you're if you're lost and you need to survive is restarting that counter restarting that three week yep. counter every single day. So you're kicking it another day down the road. Yeah. And that's what it, the interesting thing to me is that our ancestors as humans, we used to be a, we used to know and understand all of these things that were taught in this class just because we had to do that all the time. And between being nomadic and um, not having the technology that we have nowadays, 
we used to have to do that and we used to know how to do it. We used to understand how to do that all the time. And so our ancestors, potentially you could say that they were constantly kicking that three week cycle down the road. So getting back to water preparation and making sure that it is, um, it's pure enough to drink, right? And purity doesn't mean it looks clean. Purity means that you've killed the pathogens because we're in a survival situation here where we've got 72 hours that we're looking to survive. So what we did there is we actually built the fire and we, we created the container and then we went and scooped out some mud water out of a puddle and then we purified that water with hot rocks because if you're if you have a wooden container you can't necessarily put the wooden container over the fire until the water boils so the first step is okay you've got water and you've got fire now how do you take how do you a get the water how do you make a container to get the water and then once you have a container with the water in it how do you purify that water and through boiling is the the best way to do so how do you do that? How do you make something out of wood and then purify it with boiling water or boiling that water inside of the wood? And the way that we did it was with the hot rocks, like we said. So you would make the coals, make the fire, let it get hot, put the hot rocks in there. And she recommended something porous, porous rocks. Yeah. And so what you're doing then is you're creating those hot rocks. You put them in the container on top of the water and it's you can hear it sizzling because it's, it's hot rocks yeah. with, with cool water. And, uh, and you just give it a little bit of time to boil and kill all the pathogens in there. And then you can give it a drink. Now the water that we drank was, it was still mud, looked like mud, tasted like mud. It was gritty. But if I was very thirsty, I would gladly drink that water. And well, it's been a couple of days now and I'm not sick yet. So I think yeah. that it worked pretty well. Well, one of the things that, um, that, uh, I thought was interesting and we're recording still, right? Yep. Okay. Was... Uh, she said there's a difference between filtered water and purified water. Yes. Filtered water is basically just, well, getting the crap out of it. Yeah. Right. Pathogens could still be in there. Yeah, pathogens could still be in there because pathogens will pass through. But if, if, you, if you filter it through a T-shirt or, or whatever uh, or a, a, a bandana, what you're, you're getting out is, is the – the sand <laughs> yeah the sand and, and, and the, the grit and the, the you know whatever the the, the 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 really small you know garbage that you don't necessarily want to eat anyway uh, or drink uh so there's there's filtered when it, when a survival tree it filtered can be purified but <clears throat> but not necessarily filtered water might not necessarily be purified uh, and purified, purified water and purified water can be filtered, but they are not the same thing. They're not yeah, well, and purified water, like for instance, if you boil it, if you just take water, you scoop water out of a of a of a puddle or a, a lake or a pond or whatever, it doesn't matter. Let's say you had a canteen cup. You had a canteen cup, and you just dip water out of a pond, and then you boil it. Now you boiled it, and you killed the pathogens, but boiling doesn't filter it. Yeah. Boiling doesn't take out the grit or the yeah, whatever. You're still, you're still crunching on some dirt there when you drink. Yeah, it, it doesn't take that out. So uh, now your your life straws and stuff like that do both. They filter and purify. Yeah. Uh, One of the interesting things it, for the water filtration, and I actually, or I mean water purification, I learned this because of canning. But if you're, the higher elevation you are, the longer you have to boil yes. the water because the higher elevation, the water boils at a lower temp. So if you're at 7,000 feet, you need to boil it a little bit longer than if you're at sea level. Right. And um, oh, there's something else that I need to talk about there. Did, oh, you, did you talk yeah. about the it's better to have to drink the water because the the the, the problems that you'll get from the water will will, will materialize if you, if you can get rescued within 72 hours, if you're going to be, if you're trying to get rescued, there's a difference between I'm going to go hide in the woods from the zombies uh -huh. um, and deliberately not be found, or I'm trying to be found. If you're trying to be found, you'll probably, in if you're in the United States, if, or number one, if people know that you're missing, okay, that's the big one. Do people know you're missing? Are they, do they realize that they should be looking for you? And okay. is there a general idea of where you possibly could be? Right. 
So if they know that you're missing and they're actively looking for you, chances are really good because at, at the end of the day, in the United States, we have more good people than evil people still. So there, there will be good people out there looking for you if they know that they're supposed to be looking for you. So your, your job is to keep yourself alive so that it, it, they can rescue you and not recover your remains. Um, yeah, so if it's questionable, drink it. Yeah. She was talking about there's been plenty of people that have been found next to water dead. Dead because they because didn't want to drink, drink it because it, it might make them sick or whatever. So they, so instead of, so they were so worried that they might get sick that they didn't drink the water, then they ended up dehydrating. Yeah. And what happens when you get dehydrated? What happens to you? You're you noggin. Good, you don't make good decisions. You start making bad decisions. You start, you start doing bad things. It affects your ability to think. And, and now you start making bad decisions. It's like hypothermia. Uh, when you when if your if your body if your core temperature is dropping to dangerous levels, it affects your ability to make good decisions. You start making bad decisions, and those bad decisions can lead to your demise. Yep. So if it's questionable, drink it. Yeah. And uh, Dad kind of mentioned it earlier, and I don't remember if we close that loop, but most of the pathogens, the waterborne pathogens that you'll get will take longer than three days or about three days to start affecting your body. So by then you'll be in medical attention. You'll be fine. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, but, they're going to take, they're gonna, as soon as they pull you out of the woods, you're going to the hospital. Yeah. That's what, I mean, that's they're gonna standard full practice. Of antibiotics. Bags of yeah, saline and some antibiotics. Yeah. The, the food part. Did, did you, on. did you I'm eat? not done with water. Okay. The, not done with water. The ideal temp to drink the water is body temp. As close to the body temp as you can get because if it's cold, you're using, you're expending calories so that your body can uh, deal with that temperature change. Same thing if it's hot. If it's hot water, you're expending calories so that your body can deal with that temperature change. So you want to drink the water that is this, that people don't want to drink. As close that to under that. a normal condition, tepid water, you spit out. Yeah. Cold water you like, hot water you like, tepid water you don't. Yep. I like whatever. I just like water. Ocean water and pee only drink no. if you can set up a distillery. Right. We don't drink pee. I don't care what Bear Grylls told you. He's a liar. You don't drink pee. Uh, and we don't drink ocean water because the salt in the ocean water will dehydrate you. Yep. And then uh, a <coughs> filtered and purified water that occurs naturally is if you're somewhere with a dew point, you can use your hat or a bandana or whatever to collect the dew. Yeah. And you just collect it in that thing, and if it absorbs water, then you can just kind of string it out and, and get the water out of it or just suck the water right out of the yep. bandana or whatever. But somewhere with the dew point, get the dew off the plants, and you're good to go. Yeah, because that's pure water. We can move on to food and foraging. So uh, did you did you eat any any bugs or, or grass or anything like that? Uh, grass, yeah, we didn't eat any bugs. Yeah. So, But I, I did learn... That was actually the portion of the class that I was most interested in going to because I wanted to learn more about the the food that is around us mm. that we just walk out into the field and it's, it's already there. It's already growing. Um, I haven't lived in Utah long enough to really know and understand the things that are around us. Um, and we, we were, we walked through the property that we were on and we pointed out some stuff. So I took pictures and notes and whatnot about the stuff that grows naturally here in Utah. But she at the end of the class when she went over the food portion there was i think it was six items that grow pretty much everywhere and uh, i thought that was pretty interesting yeah it's like 99 percent of all grasses are edible yeah and then uh, an important thing with the food is if it's questionable do not eat it so it's the opposite of water yeah because that'll kill you right away because you got third you got three weeks or 30 days yeah so yeah don't eat don't if it's questionable don't eat it because uh, you'll you'll be hangry, but it's better to be hangry than than poisoned. Uh, and a good piece of advice she she gave the class when I was in at least is she said, if you're in an area and you want to learn what plants are edible uh, and so forth, she said, start by learning about the non edible poisonous ones. Yeah, learn to identify those first because there's actually fewer of those than there are of the opposite. And if you can learn those first, 
then you say, well, all this is what I know. These are the ones I know are poisonous and I should never eat. Bingo. And then, you know, especially uh, berries, you know. Yeah, a good general rule is anything red, don't eat it. Yeah. But there are things here like currants and obviously strawberries, but those are easy to identify. Right. But currants are a big thing in Utah. They're all over the place, but they look very similar to, I can't remember the name of the poisonous one, but they look almost exactly the same as the poisonous one. The leaves are a little bit different. So if you if you don't know, then you're like, oh, this current's delicious. Yeah, don't uh, don't eat mistletoe, uh, or or what's the plant that people poinsettias? Don't eat poinsettias. Um, that, that was a big when I was growing up. I learned that because apparently people would get poinsettia plants around Christmas time and they put them in their house. And their dogs would eat them and they would die. <laughs> so don't do that. Something that I learned that was not really related to food, but just hygiene in general in the field is that juniper, if you use that to wash your hands, the oil from the juniper will kill the oh, yeah. bacteria. Yeah. So uh, There's another one. It was jun- juniper and something else. But I yeah. Field hygiene. Basically, when you, when, you ha- if, when you make poopies. If you ain't got no sanitizer. Yeah. Well, if you make poopies, you, you, you need to take steps to try and not get, well, contaminate yourself with your own poopy. Yeah. It's nasty. It's nasty. There's no bidets in the woods. That's too bad. It should be. Yeah. It should be. Well, there can be the if you get one of those portable bidets. That's right. If you, if you, well, yeah. we're talking about surviving with, or nothing. if you do a handstand under a waterfall. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't know if I want to. Where does it go after it? Oh, uh, down. If you're doing your a face. handstand, I mean. Yeah, if you're doing a handstand, it's coming down on your face. Yeah. Well, you know, the good thing is if you're out there in the wilderness, lost all by yourself. You can take the opportunity to tan your butthole. That's right. Apparently, that's the thing that that lunatics are doing now. Oh, really? Is they're tanning their buttholes? Why? Because they're lunatics. Because because does that clean them too? Um, it probably cleans them. I don't know, but because of the sun. what happens if you get a sunburn though? It oh, makes them more something. picturesque. Mm. I thought that that's what bleaching was for. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a they there's a and then tan? there is a movement that uh, the a people that movement? that believe that say you should go out and tan your butthole. Oh, interesting. Yep. Yeah, because people have way too much time in their hands. Zach, I tagged you in the the next topic, so check that before we get to it. I did, okay. and I replied to it. Okay. Uh, can you so put um, it in there? the 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 big takeaways that I got. The big takeaways were, and I knew this already, but don't sleep on the ground. The ground will suck the heat right out of you. You will wake up freezing. You've got to put something between yourself and the earth because the earth will suck. It'll certainly suck all right. It'll suck all right. Yeah, you cut out there uh, for a second. <clears throat> the bow drill thing. That what I what I didn't get a chance to ask her, you know, she was talking about the the different types of wood that she made the the, uh, the and a, a bow drill for for uh, making fire. Uh, you can you can go around. I mean, essentially, you got nothing else to do. You're lost. So go around and try and find that. Now, the interesting part for me would be if I didn't have paracord and I had to find a way to make the actual the the string part of the bow well if, if there's several ways one of them is look at your feet yeah yeah, yeah. shoelaces you got socks or um, not socks but i wouldn't do that with the socks unless you actually absolutely yeah. had to i would cut a piece of the shirt off t-shirt cut yeah, a piece t-shirt. of the t-shirt and stretch it out uh we figured out that hair does not work or no we hair learned does not that work. hair does not work because it just it's not strong enough um Oh no, that's not true. The hair works for if you the can, string part. If you it can doesn't cord work it for yeah, if you can cord the hair, it doesn't work for um, tinder. tinder. Yeah, hair doesn't work for tinder. Uh, what did remember when Dean Friend would make cordage? He would peel the bark off of a certain plant, and it was and it was really fibrous, and you could make cordage out it's of probably that. a corn stalk. No, 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 no. It was it was a. Darn, I can't remember which one it was. But um, 
but that's also a skill. You're you're not just going to know how to do that just because you got lost. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, um, Dean and uh, Mr. Lloyd, Lloyd, they could make cordage. They could go into the woods, see a tree, peel that bark off that tree, and just sit down and turn that into usable cord. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, that's and that's a, that's a skill. The whole point of everything that we learned, whether it was the the shelter building or the fire starting or or whatever, was is that it was it was skill. And you know, it's like it's like the you know the you know if you fell off the back of a truck in your underwear, would you be able to stay alive? Um, yes. Yeah. And the, because your brain, you know, what what did. Uh, um, the, the sword is more important than the shield, and, and skill is more important than all. And the, 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 the final weapon is the brain. Yeah. All else is supplementary. Yeah, the John, final... John Steinbeck. Yeah, Steinbeck is the brain. So all these things are, you know, skill is something that that nobody can take away from you. If you have skill, that's something that you take with you everywhere. So, uh, the, and the development of skill is something that you should be seeking constantly it's almost like being a student for life oh yeah yeah you're a beginner once but you're a student for life that's right zach's like is that the end of the show it's Let's not talk about it's actually not student of the gun university we talked about it a little bit earlier do we have anything else to add to the wilderness survival yes there is zach uh i sent you one so there you go all right, well, the, the last one I have is last week's, episode 14. I'm looking at the description. It says, stop playing with your guns. That's the last one we have in there. there That's it? One. Yep, stop playing with your guns. Came out last week. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I'm going to have to get on that. Stuff and junk. Stuff and junk. All right, so. So if you go to SOTGU.com, you can get not only information about the shakeup that is coming for the learners of the martial lifestyle but you can also listen to the student of the gun university podcast and it updates every single week with the new episode and you can go there and get that yes indeed that is what you can do that is what you should do thank you very much for being here uh, we would love for you to join us tomorrow and friday for the bonus hour but that doesn't just happen on its own you have to take steps to make that happen yes indeed and that's it it's very short steps and very easy to accomplish these steps. you got to go to GetSOTG.com, sign up for the undergrad level. It, it, we got a, a $1 trial. You can get in there, get in, see if you like it, join the grad program Discord. It's a great time. GetSOTG.com, and that's fun, right, Jared? Yes. Yep. Yeah, and uh, one last thing I want to throw out to you guys is that, uh, being you two specifically, uh, oh, nope, I knocked on the number. Oh, We're oh, fine. Oh, oh. Uh, our official silicone SOTG AirPod cases should be arriving at the uh, Provo office today. Sweet. Well, there you go. Yeah. Uh, Very have cool. you got, do you guys have you guys heard about those? The official SOTG silicone AirPod cases for your AirPods or earbuds that look like AirPods. Yeah, this, this, I, I this want part's one of at those. The, this part's at the audience. Oh. Well, if you haven't or you should, shopsotg.com and get your own pair today. Just thought I'd remind you guys. Where, where do I go? Shop S O T G dot com. Oh, okay. There you go. Shop S O T G dot com. All right, now we can wrap. It's a good up. place. Now we can wrap. All right, we'll talk to you. Uh, uh, what's going to be in the uh, bonus hour? Give them a teaser. Bonus hour teaser. Yes, indeed. There is. There are notes. Uh, find, find the, strong, the guys. strong guys. What does that mean? You ask. Well, it means about finding men who are physically strong. Find the strong uh, guys at the gym and make friends with them. Also, yep. new murder has been happening. So that's fine. No, new murder chargers. Uh, we right. got an update from last week's, uh, and we have another story to talk about. Uh, are you, are you, Democrats will kill you. Are you prepared? And also some good news from Canada. Canadian province refuses to participate in Trudeau's federal gun confiscation. So that's good. Yeah. That's All good. that and more in the bonus hours coming this Thursday and Friday, because we got two of them. That's true. All right. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for being a dedicated student of the gun. We truly appreciate it. We hope you got something out of this. And I want you to remember, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life.
We appreciate your reviews. If you haven't left a review or updated yours recently, head on over to Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast player to voice your opinion. Don't forget to join us at The Student Lounge, a place for like-minded individuals to learn, connect, and support each other. No chicanery will be tolerated. Remember to check studentofthegun.com daily for new, free content and giveaways. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. Are you a social butterfly? Connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for new content each and every day at Student of the Gun. Watch Student of the Gun TV and videos from our trusted partners on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Chromecast, and even AirPlay. Go to studentofthegun.com for direct links, and remember, you're a beginner once, a student for life.